Hello, everyone. My name is Alexa, and I'm the Recruitment Specialist at the School of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape at the University of Calgary. Welcome to our uh, Bachelor of Design and City Innovation BDCI sample lecture. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I want to let you know that the session is being recorded and it will be uh, posted so you can re-watch it or share it with friends and family that might be interested uh, as well. All right. And we'll change slides, please. Okay, so to get started, I would like to introduce our panel. Um, our main presenter will be Professor Alberto de Silvetiera, uh, who will present a sample lecture on a city precedent that intersects ecology, landscape, architecture, and urbanism in a South American context. So we are very excited for that. We also have Sarah, our undergraduate program specialist, and Camille here, who is a representative of the uh, Recruitment and Admissions Network, who can answer um, any and all admission questions. So if you think of a question during the presentation, uh, please put it into the chat, and then we'll answer those at the end. All right, next slide, please. The University of Calgary, located in the heart of southern Alberta, both acknowledges and pays tribute to the traditional territories of the peoples of Treaty 7, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Siksika and the Kwikani and the Kainai First Nations, the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Good Stony First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, uh, Districts 5 and 6. Next slide, please. to a distinctly different design school experience. Community engaged, performance driven, entrepreneurial, impact oriented, and future focused. We are training leaders to become catalysts for positive local and global change so that you can learn how to develop solutions to help solve some of the world's great problems. Even me? Really? Yes, <laughs> definitely you. Through challenge-based learning, collaborations with industry, building and prototyping solutions, we are expanding the idea of what it means to be a designer. With bold thinking for the built environment, for sustainability, for equity, for health, for vibrancy, cities made for people and the good of the planet. It's not going to be easy, but you can make change happen. You can change the world. You can create the future of city building. Awesome. So at the School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape, um, we believe that the design community has an important role to play in addressing some of the most pressing societal challenges of our time, including sustainability, access and equality, climate resilience, public health, social justice and community building. Sample researchers use design-based thinking to discover and prototype potential solutions um, in collaboration with industry partners who are committed to the realization of healthy, sustainable, vibrant, and equitable cities. Tackling these challenges requires entrepreneurial thinking and a transdisciplinary approach that integrates physical, social, economic, cultural, and technological thinking towards a better future. And SAPL offers a Bachelor of Design in City Innovation, a minor in Architectural Studies, and three professional programs, a Master of Architecture, a Master of Planning, and a Master of Landscape Architecture. We also have a research-based Master's and PhD program in Environmental Design and a Doctor of Design. And today we'll focus on the new Bachelor of Design and City Innovation program. And now I am very excited to introduce our speaker today, Professor Alberto de Salvatierra. Alberto is the Associate Dean Undergraduate and Associate Professor of Urbanism and Data and Architecture at SAPL. He's also the founder and director of the Center for Civilization, a founding principal of Proxima, and an alumnus of the Global Shapers Community, an initiative by the World Economic Forum based in Geneva, Switzerland. As a transdisciplinary designer and urbanist, Alberto's research agenda and professional work is organized around 
intersections between the city and morphology, ecology, technology, and civilization. Uh, his work has been published widely and exhibited both domestically and abroad. And previously, he's been a part of the Harvard Kennedy School inaugural science, uh, technology, and society program on expertise, trust, and democracy, and an invited panelist and delegate to the UN as well. Uh, he is the past recipient of a number of prestigious fellowships and awards, and he holds a Bachelor of Architecture from Cornell University and both a Master of Landscape Architecture and a Master of Design Studies in Urbanism, Landscape, and Ecology from Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. We are very lucky to have Alberto here with us today, and thank you so much uh, for delivering the sample lecture. Um, Alberto, I'll hand it over to you. Hi, Alexa. Thank you for the very generous introduction. Uh, can everyone hear me correctly? Alexa, can you reply? Yes. Okay, perfect. So why don't we get started? Um, so within the context of the Bachelor of Design in City Innovation, this is a program that is transdisciplinary, um, bound to the very foundation of the curriculum and how we're approaching these questions of the built environment. So as a sample lecture, we thought we would share with you some research that cuts across various different types of methodologies for the research production across different types of geographies and in some ways, different sorts of questions that get borne out through the examination of a particular case study. So it is my pleasure to be sharing some of this work with you. Uh, the the um, lecture today is titled Eternal Ephemera, Soft Infrastructures in the Floating City of Uros, Peru. So let's proceed. Um, this research was very generously sponsored by the Harvard University Graduate School of Design, the Cornell uh, College of Architecture, Art and Planning, Panono, and the Center for Civilization, which is now a research lab based here in the School of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape, also known as SAPL. So it could be easily said that the history of human civilization is one of grass, wheat, rice, maize, barley, and sugar, which account for over 60% of the world's caloric intake, are only but a few of the species of grass that were pivotal in the development of large urban centers and that are still important today. But in addition to providing food, drink, paper, fuel, and clothing, these graminoids have also been directly used as building materials. Because of their overall tensile strength and lightweight nature, they can be buoyant in water and have been used to make rafts and boats. Uras thus becomes of unique interest as being a floating city made entirely out of grass. Tortora reeds specifically. And here we have a picture of what those reeds look like when they're in sort of their native environments. So what is a Tortora reed? What does it look like? Here we have a sort of an ecological architectural drawing of a section of these plants, their roots, their different stages of development, the various aspects and components of the plant, which the indigenous Uru people use across a variety of features. Uh, the one they use the most is obviously the stem. They use that for the weaving of a variety of different aspects of their built environment, as we will sort of explore shortly, uh, but they also use other aspects as well. And I think it's sort of really important to understand uh, sort of the ecological and landscape implications behind certain landscape practices, certain building practices, particularly those that are informed and operationalized by indigenous peoples. So to provide some context around the Uru people and the city of Uros. So Uros in Lake Titicaca in Peru is a civilization that predates the Incas. However, they possess no solid monuments, built no stone cities, and are semi-nomadic. It would seem that their secret to their civilizational longevity arises from their unique relationship with a single material, reeds. So where is in Uros in Peru? You know, I've already um, mentioned this before, but if you're not familiar with South America, uh, this is here, we have a Google Earth image uh, that shows the location, right, right there in the Andes. So this is Lake Titicaca, one of the highest navigable rivers in the world. And then this sort of uh, corner here is a wetland area. And in this wetland is located 
in sort of these marshes is located at Uros. It's next to this large city called Puno. And you can see here from the Sila image, the size of that city uh, in comparison with the city of Uros. And here we have it. This is sort of a Sila image that shows each of these individual man-made um, floating, I hesitate to call them islands. Uh, technically they are islands in some ways, but they're really more like barges because one can, unlike an island, you can swim underneath them, right? So they're really sort of these um, floating barges that are made out of this organic material uh, upon which more organic material constitutes a variety of the components of their built environment, their houses, um, different types of buildings, whether it's a sort of a community gathering space or a kitchen or an outhouse. Um, and we're going to examine this in a bit more, more depth. So Uros is composed of around 120 islands and islands here in, in quotation marks because they're not really islands, they're more like barges, uh, though this number varies with the years. Um, you know, as families uh, are made, some might combine and they might bring their barges together and tie them together and make a larger sort of configuration. Or if a, if a new family wants to kind of strike out on their own, they can build their own sort of mini quote unquote island. And therefore this, this number sort of is in sort of in a state of flux, but approximately around 120 islands. And if we zoom in into one of those, one of these, right, each of these individual little um, little squares, for lack of a better term, this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like up close. And uh, the, the bulk of this presentation is going to focus on one of these islands and understanding the experiential aspects of how it, what, what it's like to live here and uh, exploring the technology behind this really innovative set of construction techniques that make use of the environment and ecology in a way that's in harmony with nature in contrast to many of the practices that most cities um, sort of enact today. So here we have a aerial plan that shows the location of the island that uh, I'll be sort of exploring today. And as you can see, it's one of the further, further um, northernmost islands within this configuration. Uh, this is primarily because this island was one of the first to begin to um, welcome foreigners for tourism purposes. And when they first began welcoming foreigners, it was something that the village, the rest of the city did not want to uh, undertake. So in order to uh, avoid any further conflict, they decided to move the island uh, up to the very north. However, uh, a, a sort of satellite imagery uh, begins to show that over the, the years 2002 to 2020, the actual location of these islands moves quite frequently. As you can see here, the sort of ghosting of these different islands shows the various points in time where they were located. You know, they sort of, they would sort of close off and create this sort of large uh, communal water space in the middle. And as more and more of these emerged, uh, they, they began to change that configuration. And now this island that used to be the northernmost point, now there's quite a few more uh, up along the northern transect of, um, they call this the River Willie. Um, even in Spanish, you know, in Peru they speak Spanish, they speak Quechua, uh, but they call it River Willie, uh, like that in English. So I, I find it quite fascinating. So what does this what does what does this island look like? How's it built? That's exactly what we're gonna uh, sort of investigate just now. But this is a a typical image, right? Uh, these sort of uh, little rooms. I I don't call them houses because they're just single rooms that have walls made out of woven totara reeds, that have roofs out of woven totara reeds, sitting on plinths of, you guessed it, <laughs> totara reeds, uh, also sitting on a very, very large sort of bed of totara reeds. And of course, here you can see there are some other types of materials, like some wood for the stairs that go into each of these rooms. Uh, there's some rudimentary solar panels that provide enough electricity for one light bulb per panel. But other than that, uh, in, in many 
in, in many ways, this is really purely singularly one material. And I think that's very fascinating to think about, particularly in the context of the sites of cities that most of us probably live in. But as a case study, it becomes a really interesting examination of indigenous practices and stewardship of the land. Here we have more imagery of uh, photographs that were taken during a site visit in the summer of 2016. Uh, as part of the expansion of the island, uh, they've also begun to innovate on in some construction practices. So here, you know, they wanted to create a very large community space, but there's some structural limitations around being able to do that purely with total ravines. So they sort of buttress um, some of these components with, with wooden elements, uh, but are still retaining the total ravines as some, one of the primary elements in, in their construction. And, you know, they don't only build their buildings, but they build barges, they build, you know, parasols, they build a variety of, of different things and they read themselves um, also then planter around the perimeter for a reason that I'll explain shortly. But as, a, as because these are in some ways barges, they're not really islands in the sense that there's a solid ground underneath, it creates opportunities to fish. So you can kind of dig your hand in, make a little hole, and then because you know water is underneath, you can sort of fish directly in the middle of the island. Uh, these types of small fish can be sort of grilled and eaten, or they can be used as lures for larger fish or, or fowl. Here we have some, some close-ups of, of that. And it's it's really quite, you know, from, from a material standpoint, from an experiential standpoint, a really sort of fascinating look at the ways in which a, a specific um, culture, a specific civilization has developed and, and the ways in which these sorts of things came to be. So, in an interview I conducted with the matriarch of the, the island, the specific island that, that we've been looking at, Uros Kantati, uh, she said, living in Uros requires sea legs to handle the moving and swaying of the islands, mountain lungs to breathe the thin and oxygen poor air at 14,000 feet. As I mentioned, Lake Titicaca is the highest navigable river in the world. So for those of you familiar with Machu Picchu, that's around 6,000 to 7,000 feet in elevation, this is almost twice that amount, so at 14,000 feet. And black blood to handle the freezing winter temperatures. Uh, I visited in a North American summer, meaning that in Peru it was uh, winter, and they gave me 13 wool blankets uh, to, to sleep under. Because again, the amount of insulation in these uh, small Totoro read rooms is almost non-existent. <laughs> uh, so, but incredibly fascinating set of architectural sort of practices are emerging from these materials that the land provides. And, and here are just a few of more of those images that begin to capture some of these idiosyncrasies, of course, in addition to handmade barges, um, most residents now will also have like an actual motorized boat Although these are are used maybe for for hauling uh, larger materials or if speed is necessary to get to mainland, otherwise the barges, the the regular sort of rafts um, that don't require fuel uh, are often often used and navigated by using sort of a, a stick. So so how how do these communities? How do these sort of structures come to be? What is what is the construction process? What does it look like? Uh, how can something like this be built? So this is a section. This is a, an architectural section through an island. So it's an axonometric section. And you can see here the thickness of the island. These islands are about three meters thick uh, uh, at the sort of the narrowest point and up to four and a half meters thick at the, at the thickest points. And um, the way that these develop and grow sort of is dependent upon the resources of a particular family and how big the family is. So first, I'm going to show a brief reenactment as told by Eddie. Eddie, is, this is the gentleman here in the picture. Uh, this was the son of Christian, uh, Christina, the, the person I quoted earlier. And uh, he was very kind enough to sort of, uh, sort of demonstrate uh, with a, a little maquette that he made the, the various sort of the construction process behind Uros. So 
So I'll share that first, and then I'll sort of show the more the, the technical version of, of that process. So step one, you actually take these mud root blocks that are held together through the roots of the totara reeds. And because of the air within the reeds and because the air trapped within the mud and the decomposition of the mud, uh, these blocks end up being more buoyant than water and therefore float. So once they become unmoored from the lake bed, Lake Titicaca, they float. And they use these as their primary sort of building block upon which the islands rest. Here we have blocks that are maybe 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters or one foot by one foot. However, on average, these blocks tend to be about five meters by five meters and about one and a half meters thick. So quite large sort of units that uh, will, will then be sort of tied together with other similarly large units. So like five, four blocks of five meters by five meters ends up creating like a 20 by 20 square. That's 1.5 meters thick. And they used to kind of tie them together with uh, sticks and twine made out of reeds, but now they use nylon because it lasts longer. But this is the first step in creating this sort of floating foundation for the islands. Step two, applying a bed of flotura reeds. Uh, and they do this in across a number of layers, uh, often in alternating directions, um, in order up until the thickness of the ground reaches an additional one and a half meters. So we have one and a half meters from the base of the mud bricks and then another high one and a half meters uh, for the torture reeds to get placed on top. And of course, uh, you know, is as part of the inauguration of any new uh, island, the community comes in and sort of, you know, kind of stamps on it and helps kind of settle the, the sort of the ground and um, begins to, you know, create this kind of uniform ground condition. So uh, steps five and six are first, uh, for a variety of reasons, these rooms need to be elevated, right? If they're standing on the ground, um, weather, whether it's rain or cold temperatures uh, from being close to the ground and, and sort of in connection to, to, the, to the lake body are going to be much colder. So what they do in order to further insulate uh, and sort of resist against weathering and decay is to elevate their buildings on these plinths of like additional piles, really, uh, of torture reeds. And then of course, build sort of bedrooms on top. So, so these are meant to represent like a traditional bedroom. Uh, this is generally the bulk of, of all these things that you see here in the background are all individual bedrooms that have one sort of like chair and then a, uh, a bed, right? And then, Step seven is usually the creation of an outhouse or a place to um, go to the bathroom. For a long time, um, sanitation was, I mean, there isn't any connected sewage, of course, in these moving barges. So uh, often a lot of the practices around going to the bathroom was, you know, to relieve oneself in the lake. Now, with additional technology, many islands have uh, compostable toilets that rely on sort of a dry mechanism. Um, and, but generally, this, this will be part of, of the sort of construction plan to create these little additional rooms, whether it's a washroom or a storeroom, um, that typically have a slightly different architectural typology to distinguish them from the, the kind of the traditional one room bedroom. And then step eight is the, the construction of the final but most important piece of architecture, architectural element in these islands. And as you can see here, you can probably guess what it is, and that's a kitchen. Now, in contrast to these other ones that are rendered and shown with reeds, here we have a kind of a, a stone base with a sort of clay uh, kind of a stylized architecture sort of room. And this is meant to represent a kitchen. And they're they're sort of built in the same way as, as the regular Totoro Reed rooms, but in the inside is sort of coated with mud and clay 
in order to provide some fireproofing. Because again, if, if the kitchen were to go up in flames, the entire island would also very quickly, most likely catch fire. But this is usually the last thing that gets built. Uh, and it's the first thing that gets used because the inauguration of a new island is usually a community event um, that invite, everybody is invited to the island. Uh, and therefore the sort of kitchen is sort of the, one of the primary hubs that, that serves those, those events. So, so that, that's, those are the steps in, in the perspective from, from Eddie. Uh, and I want to show them again, um, sort of showing some more technical diagrams as to how some of these things come together. So as I mentioned, this is a five by five uh, by 1.5 meter mud and totoro reed root block. They're tied together with sticks and ropes. Uh, here we have a configuration of six, but it can be four, it can be six, uh, enough so that there's enough surface to build a variety of structures. And then you have the first layer of reeds, the second layer of reeds, the third layer of reeds, fourth layer of reeds. Then we have the plinths of reed. Then we have the building units on top. And then finally, um, most of these islands also get an like actual live totoro reeds planted around them, creating a sort of a live barrier that helps pre uh, protect against wind, but also creates habitats for fish and fowl. So again, really, really smart strategies to use this material in these ways while also remaining in harmony and collaboration with the land and with nature. So here we have a building section to understand how exactly this is put together. So we have a, a basic wood frame that helps keep things um, standing upright. Uh, on top of the wood frame, you know, we have a draped roof of this sort of flexible material. We, uh, we have the walls also out of woven torture or reeds. And on the left, we have a typical bedroom unit. As I mentioned, there's a bench, a bed, night table, and then sort of a, a more typical community gathering space will generally have either seating or these sort of uh, woven, they're basically just large logs, but out of, out of reeds and they put a kind of a piece of cloth on top to allow for people to sort of sit around a table. And they're, they're quite low in terms of their heights. So, you know, the bedroom is around 1.5 meters tall and the community space is around 1.8. And here we can sort of understand some of those dimensions. Um, and again, these plants are 1.5 uh, meters tall. So um, this is what an island might start off looking like. We have two bedrooms, we have a storeroom, we have uh, a sort of a, a washroom, uh, and then slowly this these things can can begin to to expand. Um, and the nature of the expansion and the sort of the types of things that get included or not are sort of dependent upon each individual family, how much it's growing, what are their resources, uh, et cetera. And so this, this sort of actually maps the growth of the Urus Kantati Island, how it started and how it sort of grew and expanded over time by adding more and more elements. So, so that's sort of the, the stage at which, uh, when I was there, I, which upon, you know, where I left it, right? Since then, you know, 2016 was a number of years ago, the configuration of this probably has shifted. So here are a few more images around the, the experience of being in Lake Titicaca, of sort of navigating the waterway to see these various islands, the different sort of units, um, how different families choose to organize the space. And here we can see that planted buffer, because again, all this is artificial. So even though this looks natural, it looks like it existed here, this is all artificial. This is all man-made. So man-made doesn't only mean, you know, glass and steel. It could also mean things that look natural, right? Um, so, so really quite fascinating. This sort of a view down the middle of River Willie, and you can see uh, all the various sort of things. And now, in you know, in the years since Uros Cantati began, you know, welcoming foreigners and hosting kind of uh, 
like bed and breakfast situations, more and more islands have begun to embrace tourism as a source of revenue and as a livelihood. And therefore here you can see the emergence of signs that say, you know, welcome or branding the island in a particular way and kind of selling a particular experience. And part of the desire of this research is that a lot of the literature around Uros was aimed at Western tourists, you know, come here for the nice sort of, you know, experience, take your pictures and you can leave. But there wasn't a lot of very serious scholarship dedicated to understanding how these things came together, how they came to be, how are the Uru people using this technology? Um, and how do they continue to remain uh, quite a resilient group of, of people? Uh, there's also these these two buildings here. You can, you know, for those of you that uh, have sharp observational skills, you can see though they're not made out of torture or reeds. These are actually um, ele elementary school, so two small classrooms. Um, the Peruvian government, you know, the Uros, the Uru people requested from the Peruvian government assistance with creating um, a public school. They did not want to go through the process of, you know, doing the usual building practices. So they built these, uh, I don't know what the base is on, what it's floating on, uh, but the the walls are, are basically just corrugated metal and, and the roof. So the Peruvian government was like, we we don't understand or care about how you do things. We're just going to do it this way, which is unfortunate. But here we have um, more, more barges and such. And of course, there are some that are larger and they're often more ceremonial uh, that could use for, for very large events in the, in the community. Here are a few more pictures. So this is a really interesting image that sort of shows a cross section of that thickness of the, the totara reeds, right? So here on the bottom are reeds that have decayed and have dried out, right? Then we have older reeds and these green ones are like super fresh, right? And this really captures that, that transect uh, in very clear ways. And it sort of shows that, you know, over time, this delay at the bottom decays so constantly they're having to replenish the floor. So in the wet season, which is the summer, they replenish the floor um, every two weeks, meaning they're constantly applying new reeds. And then in the dry season, which is the winter, they apply every three weeks. So here we have more of those images. Here we have this sort of ceremonial barge. And part of this research was sponsored by Panono, which is now uh, an extinct company. But back then, back in 2016, they were an emerging 360 degree uh, camera company based in Germany. Uh, and they sold very expensive 360D cameras before they become popular, before they costed like $200. These costed, you know, anywhere from three to $5,000. So I made them a deal and I told them, you know, if you give me your camera for free, I'll take all these pictures um, to capture the cultural patrimony that is Uros. And we can use these to further advertise the product. And they were like, deal. So uh, I was able to use their technology to capture these 360 degree panoramas that sort of look like this first image, but I've turned them into these kind of globes um, that, that begin to sort of demonstrate these, these sort of unique, this unique mini world onto, onto the own, right? So here is from the center of the Uros Kanati Island and you can see all the areas around it. There's, they have a, a hole within their islands. So this is like the lake bottom and they built a bridge over it, which I think is so funny. Um, so they also use it to fish, right? They use it as an aesthetic feature. That's where this one was taken. They have a, a lookout point and you can see the, the whole island here with their sort of a touch of buffers and some of their, their barges here kind of parked. 
or board. Do we have more images? Uh, that's me taking a picture from one of these barges uh, or boats uh, that they use a, a very large stick to navigate with. Because as we saw in the section, Lake Titicaca is actually quite shallow. Um, so uh, sufficiently long sticks are like the Venetian gondolas. You can sort of use it to kind of move around. So something that's particularly interesting is that this sort of condition of urbanity is, isn't is only present in Uros. So I've mapped other locations around the planet where this, this these types of um, settlements are have also emerged. So this is a but my, this is a fuller projection or a Damaxian map for those of you that uh, might be map buffs. This is South America, this is North America, Canada. So this is Uros, Peru, and we're gonna sort of very quickly go through through some of these. So Uros, they take Kaka Peru. Uh, they use totara reeds, right? Uh, we have Mitala and Lake Upemba in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Now, unfortunately, this is a situation where, because of warfare, the local community sort of fled to a marshy area and used the resources and the grasses in that area to build their own community. So because it's an area that's experiencing uh, uh, unrest, civil unrest, and other conflicts, there are very few images that one can find around this particular settlement. This is the only one I found on the internet. Uh, but you can sort of see that the same principles that we see applied in Uros are applied in this particular location. Then we also have the Madan, um, also called the, the Marsh Arabs, in the Tigris-Euphrates marshlands in Iraq. And this is also a historical image. This is what that community used to look like. It used to number in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, but in the 1990s, Saddam Hussein, the the very popular one that, you know, um, became part of uh, geopolitical discourse during the Bush administration, the second Bush administration, well, both the first and second Bush administrations, um, that Saddam Hussein decided to poison this area because these uh, these this community belonged to different sort of religious uh, sect than, than he did. So most of the Madan are almost extinct because most of them died unfortunately. And there's a historical image that shows that community. Uh, and I think the, the the starkest difference between Uros and, and the Madan here are that they use barrel bolts, right? They use barrel bolts rather than kind of the, the, the configurations that the Uru people use. So here we have these sort of curved conditions. And again, it's also a marshy area. So that I guess that, that says something about um, how useful and how productive marshes can be in terms of providing places to live. Then, you know, beyond these more traditional settlements, there are other ways in which communities have also used uh, grasses, whether they're reeds or rice, uh, to, to create other Kind of structures that float in the water. So here we have uh, Kabul Lamjao in the Loktak Lake in India. And and here they use these to sort of uh, create these enclosures for agriculture and for raising fish, right? They don't necessarily live on them, but they use them for water agriculture uh, and, and raising different species of, of fish and, and seafood. So Again, a really interesting application of, of grasses, right? Glasses and the sort of buoyant condition. Then we have Chong Kanias in um, Cambodia, in the Tonle Sap Lake. Um, here, here we have, uh, we can see some of the vestiges of the construction. They use grasses, very similar to uh, Uros. But we also have here an image that sort of shows uh, the introduction of other types of materials like wood in order to create barges or boats. 
uh, to further sustain this kind of semi aquatic, semi sort of terrestrial um, living conditions. We have Kwa Bao Bang, uh, Kwa Ban, Ban Ba Hong in Halong Bay. I apologize for any mispronunciation there. Uh, and here they use bamboo, which is also a grass. Bamboo is a grass, it's not a wood. Uh, although here we see a lot of wood, unfortunately. Um, but again, it's another example of a community that is primarily sort of uh, using grass materials to exist while floating on a water body. And then finally, the Bajau Laut, the sea gypsies in the coral triangle in Malaysia. This group is unfortunately also going extinct, given this is the last known community of the Bajau um, Bahau Laut. They are a nomadic people that before the introduction of borders and this notion of countries and you know zones, um, they used to um, kind of move around at different points in time within within the coral triangle in Malaysia. That also touches areas from other countries, uh, because but, but because now international waters and other types of political territories and delineations have, have really helmed them in and have prevented them from, from exercising their traditional nomadic uh, practices where they would sort of go to a new place and build these kind of uh, structures and shallow water, uh, often out of the materials that they find. Here we see a lot of uh, grass and wood, although probably a lot of bamboo as well. Um, but now, unfortunately, some of um, some of these committees, there's only one left uh, because the pressures to sort of settle and belong to one particular place are quite high. So some some final some final thoughts, and then we want to leave some, some space to talk about a little bit more about the BDCA program and some time for questions for any of you that might have any. But one of the interesting things is that all of the images I showed uh, prior to these, so all of, all of these, Everything that you see here, and in particular, this island. No longer exists. Right? Why? Because all of these things have decayed away already. Uh, the average lifespan of one of these rooms is two years. The average uh, lifespan of a roof is like one and a half years. The average span of these plants is one and a half years. So this is the landscape that's constantly in a state of flux, constantly in a state of decay, that's constantly needing to have to be rebuilt. So everything that you see here, everything that's been captured in these images no longer exists. Like there might be aspects of it, you know, there might be echoes of these buildings in the exact same places and the exact same proportions. Uh, but these buildings as they are now no longer exist because they've already decayed away. It's been eight years. There's multiple cycles. There's been at least two to three, even four cycles of, of all of these buildings. So it's sort of really fascinating to think about that this is a culture that predates the Incas, right? They've been around for a thousand years at least. Um, and, and they've done this through this eternal ephemera, right? Hence the title of, of the presentation. So it's, it's, it's really quite fascinating to sort of think about in, in these larger terms. So, so these the final thoughts, right? When material, environmental, and sociocultural conditions are in a state of flux, evolving in a state of palpable indeterminacy, how might prevailing assumptions about cities and their spatial manifestations be rethought? How might one address questions of resilience in the built environment in the contemporary but uncertain context of globalizing forces, economic pressures, sea level rise, and climate change? You know, landscape art and architecture explorations of the indeterminate and ephemeral are not new, yet these concerns are both timely and acutely necessary to be critically addressed. And there's a sort of deep investigations that I think are representative of the types of questions and examinations that are gonna be part of the Bachelor of Design and City Innovation Program. Now, this this section, this sort of lecture sits more within kind of the, the history, theory, global citizenship component, but of course the program as Alexa is going to sort of share in just a, in just a minute, uh, also integrates other aspects of data science, studio culture, uh, sustainability, entrepreneurship, again, to round out these perspectives and prepare students for 21st century issues within the built environment. 
So everyone, thank you. Um, this is the, the presentation, but we're now gonna move on to share a little bit more about the BDCI program for those of you who might be unfamiliar, and then we'll take some questions at the end. So I'm just gonna do this new share, and then that. All right, so thank you so much, Alberto, for sharing their sample lecture with us. That was excellent and uh, so much to you know learn. And the photography throughout the presentation was just incredible. So thank you. Um, and now we want to shift gears slightly, like Alberto said, and tell you more about the Bachelor of Design and City Innovation Program. So do you want to design a better world? one that's healthier, vibrant, sustainable, and equitable. Uh, the BDCI gives students uh, design-based framework, tools, and skills for thinking about the world and its challenges so that they can create positive change in the built environment through inclusive, sustainable, city-focused solutions. Uh, the program focuses on hands-on, studio-based learning to tackle real-world pro uh, projects. Uh, it provides literacy and advanced uh, digital uh, design tools, data science, entrepreneurship, sustainability, as a Alberto mentioned, and ultimately it creates a spark of innovation for the betterment of communities and this and society. So if you want to become an architect, planner, landscape architect, or pursue a city building related career in business law, uh, public policy, or social work, uh, really like there's so many options, uh, then the BDCI program is for you. And uh, in the common core requirements of the BDCI program, students engage in a variety of exper experiential learning opportunities, including challenge-based, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary type of community center courses. Uh, students also acquire design ability, skills, and theoretical frameworks with which to address complex city-based issues. Uh, so through their courses, students are progressively sharpening their presentation, collaboration, interdisciplinary, and community building skills, as well well as really key um, things for when they go out uh, into their different fields, such as project management and also leadership. The BDCI offers a customized learning experience. So it's a four year, 120 unit degree consisting of common core courses, and then students can kind of customize from there. So they have the option to complete a concentration that they apply for in architecture or landscape architecture. Um, they can also do a minor in these areas we've listed, such as urban studies, health and society, management and society, or data science to kind of complement and kind of uh, provide a specialization that way. They can also do an embedded certificate um, in sustainability studies or entrepreneurial thinking. Um, and these are all the ways that this is really customizable so you can pursue things that you are interested in um, and you want to become more specialized in uh, for later on as well. And the electives really allow you to craft this individualized learning experience. So students who are interested in becoming a planner uh, can choose electives that will prepare them specifically for that field. And then nearing the end of the program, there's work integrated learning course and capstone project course, which will align uh, with the student's area of interest that they've developed through uh, the program. So if you're interested in learning more about the program or if you have questions, please let us know. You can attend our monthly Ask Apple session. You can schedule a one-on-one -on -one session with our advisors through the Elevate system on our website. Um, you can email us at bdci at sapple.ucalgary.ca. And as a friendly reminder, the application portal is now open. Um, we really appreciate everyone's interest in the program and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Now we will invite our panelists to join us as we've arrived at the question and answer period. So if you do have a question, uh, please write it in the chat and then we will answer those. Um, you can also use the Q&A function um, to ask your questions and they can be about the sample lecture um, from this evening. They can also be about the program more generally um, and like I said, we do have expertise here in our panel um, for if you have questions about the application as well. Um, I also want to mention that into the chat, I did already put some helpful links for you. So you do have the uh, BDCI uh, overview page as well as our uh, future students page. So you can attend future events if you choose. Um, our contact information, as well as a helpful link there to schedule a consultation um, with one of our advisors if uh, you would like to discuss your, um, your case more specifically, or you have more detailed questions. Um, and then we also have uh, social media as well. All right, so we have a question about the BDCI program here that's come in. What are class sizes like? 
Um, maybe Alberto, do you want to discuss some of the classes? Absolutely. So that's a fantastic question. And class sizes vary depending on the type of course. So there are some courses that are lecture courses. These will be large um, uh, sizes, depending on the size of the class. So our incoming class in the fall of 2023 is going to be uh, a maximum of 132 students. So large lecture courses would be at that scale. However, uh, all other courses, like a studio course, will be in smaller sections of, of 22 students uh, working with individual faculty. And as the as the program continues to progress through different types of courses, different modalities, whether it's a lecture or a seminar or a studio or sort of a more tutorial-based course uh, that have sort of smaller tutorial sections, there, there's a, a high degree of, of variability. Uh, but again, trying to service and provide the best sort of perspectives, the best sort of expertise uh, and the best sort of training around some of these issues. So thank, thank you for that, that question. Okay, thank you. And I have another one here. Um, do you have to submit a portfolio uh, for the application? And as I guess a part of that, um, do you have to be good at art? <laughs> That's a fantastic question. I'll defer to Sarah to take that one. Hi everyone, I'm the undergraduate program specialist. Unfortunately, the video function doesn't work for me when I try to on the Zoom. So not trying to snub people here. I wanted to meet you all virtually as well. Uh, but just jumping into that question, in terms of admissions, um, I will just remind students that when you are applying for an undergraduate program, you do go through central admissions. So we do have the future students team here who can support you with that just as a general um, heads up. But the reason why is SAPL does not review or make offers in terms of admissions. All of that is handled by the central admissions team. So quick answer to your question is no, you don't require a portfolio um, as per the admission requirements listed on the page. So I do recommend taking a look through there. And then in terms of the art skills, uh, what's been great is that the BDCI program, as it mentions, is an introduction to design thinking. Um, you come in, you can have design skills, but you don't necessarily require it. Um, the reason why students will take this program is either to further their skills in creativity and design or to learn more about it and build those skills. Um, so in our current cohort right now, we're seeing that range of students who um, there's some who are thriving with those design skills. And then we see other students who have been piqued um, by those uh, design skills that they want to build. And so they, they're learning that and picking that up. So bottom line is you don't need those art skills. You will pick them up as you go. But if you are curious or if you want to learn more, like there's no harm in picking up those skills over the summer or at a workshop just to prepare yourself. But you'll be surrounded by a cohort of people where some will be more experienced and some will be learning and you'll fit right in with everyone there. And to maybe briefly add to that, thank you, Sarah. For those of you that might be interested in pursuing a master of architecture or a master of landscape architecture or planning, those are professional degrees. If you want to practice as an architect, you need a, a master's degree. Those degrees, because they're, they're professional degrees, do require a portfolio. So the BDCI program becomes, a, in some ways, a four-year preparation uh, for students who want to go in that direction. But of course, the BDCI, as a degree, also can stand alone and prepare uh, students for a number of fields that intersect with the built environment, not necessarily in the context of, of a professional architecture or a landscape architecture degree. Awesome. Thank you both. And actually, if we can just clearly lay that out, the next question was around what is the, uh, where does the BDCI fit within the education of becoming an architect? But maybe can we talk about where BDCI fits in the, the professional kind of streams? Because we can do, ar become an architect, you know, later on, but you can also become a landscape architect and a planner as well. So maybe can we talk about that transition from how BDCI uh, sets, sets students up for those programs, please? Absolutely. So for those of you that are interested in becoming a licensed architect, for instance, uh, you will need to complete a Master of Architecture. And in order to get admitted into a Master of Architecture program, at least in Canada, uh, you'll have to submit a portfolio uh, and you'll have to 
um, sort of demonstrate some level of skills around design and other types of, of visual production. So the there's two ways that one can go into a master of architecture or master of planning or master of landscape architecture. You can either go at it through the Bachelor of Design and City Innovation program, or there's also, you know, let's say you're really interested in biology or you're really interested in physics or you really, you know, want to learn about anthropology. So you can actually also have any sort of undergraduate degree that's not a BDCI degree. So let's say, um, you know, biology. Um, and, you know, at the end of your biology degree, you can apply for the Master of Architecture program, which is a three-year program. However, uh, you can also, if you're at the UFC, we also offer within the School of Architecture a minor in architectural studies. So this minor prepares students to basically skip the first year of their graduate work. So the Master of Architecture program, they get to skip that first year. Um, so let's say you're doing biology. In the last year of you doing biology, you do the minor in architectural studies. Uh, you do all, the, all well in those courses. And so therefore you have completed the foundation year. And then you go directly into year two of the Master of Architecture and are able to complete it in, in two years. So there's those sort of three ways. Either you can do the Bachelor of Design, it's a four-year program. And as part of the program, you complete the first year of the Master of Architecture or the Master of uh, Landscape Architecture, which are three-year programs. So then upon going into those programs, they will only last two. So it would be kind of a four plus two system, or you can do any an unrelated discipline and do like four or five years from that discipline, plus the three years of the architecture and landscape architecture, or the master planning is just two years uh, regardless of, of the background. But having um, a design degree really goes a long way to strengthen an application and provide a really sort of holistic, transdisciplinary perspective in, in many of the questions that the professional programs continue to interrogate. So the Bachelor of Design becomes a really sort of unique preparation that perhaps another trajectory might not provide, even, even if one goes through like say the biology plus the minor in architectural studies route, for instance. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, okay. This person has a great question. Um, after graduating with the BDCI, what kind of a small business can they open, uh, such as a startup company or something the like? Um, maybe Alberto, do you have any ideas on small businesses? So so, yeah, so that's the first time we've encountered that question. So thank you. That's uh, some creative thinking there. And I think, you know, what kind of small business can you open after you complete the Bachelor of Design and Innovation program? The answer is whatever you like. And the reason why, you know, I don't say that to be sort of nonchalant or to be dismissive, right? The reason why it's whatever you'd like is because what is unique about the Bachelor of Design and Innovation program compared to other programs is that it not only teaches content, but it teaches skills. So if you're going to learn 3D modeling, you're going to learn a variety of different software, whether it's Rhinoceros, Revit, Maya, Blender, the Adobe Suite, so Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, After Effects, um, different types of tools. And because of the range of skills and actual knowledge, you know, using a wood shop, metal shop, how to build models, how to 3D print models, these are all skills that can be applied in a variety of different ways. So if you want to design furniture, if you want to have a sort of a design consultancy or an art consultancy, or if you want to work in marketing, all of these skills are inherent and part of what the BDCI teaches, right? So, and that's why we sort of combine it with entrepreneurial thinking and classes in entrepreneurship in order to provide students the holistic perspective and how to operationalize these skills in ways that they might be interested in. So it, it really sort of depends on your interests uh, that might determine what type of businesses you can open. Uh, but for example, those that um, have an architecture background, for instance, uh, have open bakeries using sort of uh, 3D printed food, right? Or molds that they've designed and they sort of, they're sort of made and, and they're kind of very kind of geometric and architectural. You can sort of look up online like architecture school, baking, right? Um, so there, there's quite a range of things and it's really up to your imagination. Awesome, that's so cool. Okay, on to our next question here. Um, are there any paid or unpaid internships while studying with the BDCI? And maybe Alberto, can we briefly discuss the work integrated learning opportunities that we have throughout BDCI? 
Yes, absolutely. So that's where I was going to start. So within the program, we have a course called Work Integrated Learning Studio. And this is a, a, a studio, this is a course that where we are partner, we partner students with a community organization, a municipality, a company to work with them on a project that they'll be working on as part of their class in order to experience, quote unquote, the real world uh, within still within the context of, of an education. Uh, and that's called the Work Integrated Learning Studio. Um, and there's going to be a variety of different options the students can select in order to participate in that, whether they're in the architecture stream, the landscape architecture stream, or might be looking something more related to planning. Um, so because that, that happens within the context of the class, it's not paid, right? It's not compensated. Uh, but there are a variety of employment opportunities within the School of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape. One of the really fantastic things about the school is that we have a very active research environment. We have a number of different research labs, the Laboratory for Integrative Design, the LID, that often does a lot of things with parametric design and urban furniture. We have the Center for Civilization, the, the, the research lab that I run, that does a lot of work with municipalities around um, the, you know, providing services to help orient urban design um, policies and help stimulate uh, economic development through strategic interventions, right? But we, ha we have a number of different labs and often many of these faculty members who get grants and get sort of agreements for projects with the city of other projects will end up hiring students uh, to participate. And those are paid positions. We also have other types of summer work that can be done. So we, um, SAPL recently joined the program for undergraduate research experience or PURE. Uh, Sarah, would you like to talk a little bit about that as the faculty coordinator? Yeah, sure. So PURE is the program for undergraduate research experience. Um, and we are working with basically everyone on campus here to offer undergraduate research experiences. Essentially a student, any undergraduate student at U of C can pair with a supervisor, um, not just in Sable, but across campus. Um, they choose a, a supervisor to work with and they send in a proposal that they work with um, work on with the supervisor. And if they are successful, what happens is they are awarded a studentship that they can use over the summer towards research. So you're basically getting uh, a scholarship to get to do research with someone on campus, with a, a faculty member on campus. And of course, uh, we have a lot of um, awesome faculty members here in SAPL who can support you in those research interests. And what we're seeing here is that a lot of our current BDCS students are connecting with our SAPL faculty supervisors, and then they also have the opportunity to explore what other supervisors are on campus that they could work with, that they could blend, um, and do kind of a transdisciplinary approach in terms of their research. So maybe they're interested in um, 3D imaging or something like that, but with a business mindset to it, or maybe to approach a biological sciences um, realm. So there's a lot of opportunity for students to work within SAPL, uh, but also to work across campus with other faculties in their research endeavors. And as you know, um, fall 2023 is our first cohort of BDCI students and our first years are already getting involved in PEER. So it's very exciting for us because we wanna make sure that research opportunities are accessible to even our first years. No, that's absolutely right. Thank you, uh, Sarah. And maybe one last th uh, thought around that question is that other internship opportunities are up to the individual students. Although we have a healthy amount of postings that we place on our sort of job board called Elevates that connects students to job opportunities over the summer during the semester. And because we have very close relationships to a variety of municipalities, often our students get to work with the city of Calgary, the city of Airdrie, uh, both in a formal capacity as interns or through these research projects and collaborations that happen with faculty or as a part of other types of research programs like PEER, like Sarah mentioned. Awesome. Okay. Thank you both. And we have time for one more question here. Um, so how integrated is technology in the class uh, while also working with more traditional architectural mediums for making models and designing buildings? Um, so how do we use technology? Fantastic question. I think it starts with the basics, right? So the very, very first sort of introduction to um, sort of visualization will involve 
uh, you know, analog methods of production. So hand drawing, hand sketching, right? Um, the learning how to use um, your hands as the primary means of, of production in drawing. And as the program progresses, more and more software get introduced that help augment that initial production, right? So uh, you learn the Adobe Suite. So now you can begin to kind of scan your sketches and layer them together to make collages. Or you learn uh, Rhinoceros, which is a 3D modeling program. So now you can kind of put your ideas in 3D. Eventually you can learn how to 3D print them. Once you're 3D printing them, you can make maquettes that are a combination of both 3D printed aspects and maybe things that you're generating with your hands, like your laser cutting things or you're putting in trees or you're kind of painting it, right? So we have a computational design stream that will also teach course um, skills around uh, programming and scripting and sort of the use of algorithms and generating design ideas. So Python, Grasshopper. So technology and digital design is integrated into the aspect of the BDCI, but so are analog methods of production because these things are very necessary. So uh, as part of the Transcaler Studios, um, some of the options will be around small scale, medium scale, or large scale. And the small scale ones will be things like urban furniture projects. So those will be things that you'll have to learn how to cut lumber and weld metal and build something with your hands. So there's a, there's a quite a range of things. You know, ArcGIS is another program that we, we will teach in the BDCI program. Uh, ArcGIS Pro, you know, how to kind of, you know, spatialize some of these just spatial data. Uh, so all these things really central to the BDCI program. Awesome. Okay, great question. So thank you, everyone. I think we'll conclude our session now, but I want to thank everyone who joined us and who's um, showed uh, interest in this uh, new BDCI program. We're very excited um, that you were able to join us tonight. Um, please always... Um, email us or join an Ask Apple session if you do have follow-up questions that we weren't able to get to tonight. Um, I want to thank Alberto for your amazing uh, sample lecture. It was so great. And I want to thank our panelists also for helping us with the questions this evening. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll see you at uh, future events and uh, hopefully also your application. Um, take care, everyone. Thank you.